Well, we've hit the hour here, so let me get started. Welcome everyone to Fall 2022. Uh, this is the VEMO seminar, the Virtual Atomic Molecular and Optics. Um, so today we're going to start off with our first seminar, but maybe just let me um, say thank you to everyone who's here and participating. Uh, the board uh, for VEMOS is slightly changed this year. I'm um, taking over the chair position. Uh, other board members that we have here are Jonathan Weinstein, Michael Chinney, Christian Sanders just joined us, and uh, Kaden Hazard just, just logged on. Hi. Um, and Elizabeth Goldschmidt, our speaker today, is a former uh, board member who's kindly um, agreed to give the first talk for our fall um, our fall session here. So um, yeah, to get started, um, I'm going to introduce Elizabeth and then um, please uh, go into your talk. We have a few different modalities here for questions. So if you are in the audience on Zoom, you can use the Q&A function uh, to uh, set some questions. And if you're watching live on YouTube, you can also use the chat function or um, there on YouTube and we will monitor both places to collect questions for our speaker today. Um, and I didn't confirm this with you, Elizabeth, but I think you'll be stopping a couple of times through the talk um, to let us catch up with questions before we get to the very end. So. Um, without any further ado, I guess we can get started. Um, it's my pleasure today to introduce Elizabeth Goldschmidt. She's a professor at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Elizabeth completed her bachelor's degree at Harvard, followed by um, a PhD at the JQI in the University of Maryland. She started off as a staff scientist at the Army Research Lab before moving to Illinois in 2019, right before pandemic started. So good, great timing, Elizabeth, but uh, she's been keeping up doing a bunch of really interesting work. And um, it's my pleasure to introduce this talk on quantum photonics with emitters in solid state. So Elizabeth, please take it away. Thank you so much, Lindsay, uh, for the introduction. And thank you for the invitation slash volunteering of me to give the first seminar. Um, I'm glad to be here. It's been a while since I've given a virtual talk actually at this point, And so I'm trying to remember. Um, you can see my laser pointer uh, here. Okay, great. So, excellent. Um, so yes, as, as Lindsay mentioned, I will stop for questions um, throughout, so, so please feel free. Um, so I'm gonna talk today um, about uh, doing quantum photonics with emitters in solid state. And I guess the first question is, what do I mean when I mean quantum photonics and what are we actually talking about here? And so what my focus is gonna be today is on doing things that can be used for quantum networking um, going forward. And so now, what do I mean when I say quantum networking? Obviously here, I've got my nice picture of my little tiny sets of qubits with photons flying between them. And so what my quantum network is, is the kind of base unit of it is some kind of quantum light matter interface. So something that I have that lets matter-based qubits talk to light-based qubits in a quantum way. And this is because the way that I'm gonna transmit quantum information in my quantum network is with light. So for today, I'm gonna to be talking mostly about using single photons, uh, individual photonic qubits, to transmit quantum information. Um, in fact, this could be done with other non-classical states of light. But an important thing to note is that if this channel here that is connecting our nodes lives at room temperature, that is, it's not inside of a cryostat somewhere, then really the only thing that's suitable to carry quantum information over that channel is light of some kind. Um, so I don't know the extent to which I have to convince people that that's true. Uh, microwaves are not suited because of the black body background at room temperature. There are microwave uh, photons, there's microwaves just happening all around, coming off of everything which is at room temperature. And so you have too much of a background to send kind of single microwave photons as qubits um, at room temperature. And then kind of anything else you can imagine, you can't really imagine staying co coherent um, over so that channel, which is why we have to use light. So these nodes that I've drawn with my little spins here, these can be anything from a handful of qubits to say an entire quantum computer. And, and we're gonna be more talking about the connections between them, um, but the applications depend on what, what the nodes actually are. 
And then the main function of what we're actually trying to do is we're trying to entangle these qubits, which are separated by these channels um, and establish entanglement across these nodes. And why do I want to build up a network where I can and have established entanglement across nodes? Well, I can imagine a lot of things. Um, so one is if all I can do is build small quantum computers and I want to make a big quantum computer by connecting up a bunch of small quantum computers the way that we do do the most powerful computing today where we connect together many quantum computers. There are also a variety of kind of interesting protocols that exist whereby if we live in a future world where IBM or Google has some very powerful quantum computer um, that they would like to make available to people who would like to run computations on it who don't have their own quantum computer. But people don't want to have to tell IBM what computation they would like to run. A quantum network can enable things like that, um, blind quantum computing and other, other private protocols where you're using an established entanglement link between your small quantum system and some large quantum system in order to, to do something without having to tell anybody what it is. There are also a variety of proposals for doing things like distributed sensing using entangled sensors. So an entangled network of clocks could be much, much better than just a network of clocks. Um, and then finally, secure communication, which is kind of the uh, original application that people thought of for quantum communication and quantum networks, um, in which you're just using entanglement or, or, or even just non-commuting operators sometimes to be able to send um, information securely all right, so there are lots of feasible physical architectures um, in order to do this, this, this establishment of entanglement across nodes. Um, so one is I create entangled photon pairs and I store them in quantum memories at my nodes. One is that I have at my nodes qubits that can emit photons that are entangled with them so that I have this entanglement established. Another is I have at my nodes uh, quantum computers based on superconducting qubits, which can emit microwaves that are that are entangled with the system in, in one way or another, and then I upconvert those microwaves into the, the, the optical spectrum in order to be able to send them over some distance. And then finally, um, there are some, some interesting things like making um, highly multi-particle states of photons with, with a lot of entanglement in them, these graph states, and then sending those off um, and establishing entanglement that way with these highly entangled states of photons. And then there are probably a whole bunch of other ways to imagine doing this. And what I'm going to talk about today is the fact that some kind of coherent quantum emitter, and when I say coherent quantum com emitter, this is the Vamos seminar, you can think atom. I basically mean atom. Um, but because I'm going to broaden past just real atoms that live in vacuum, I'm going to use the more general term of a, of a quantum emitter, um, can help with all of these schemes. So, so what are the challenges in building up um, this system and using photons to transmit quantum information? So first, um, making one photon at a time is hard. So a regular light source like a laser or a lamp uh, emits photons with, with natural photon number fluctuations. Uh, and why is that important? Well, if I, if I want to have a qubit, I need to specify the state, the quantum state of my qubit in every degree of freedom, and particle number is a degree of freedom, right? So photon number is not a good quantum number for most states of light, but we do have to specify it in general if we would like to use this, and so this can be challenging. Two, maybe one of the biggest ones, um, photons get lost, right? So they travel real fast, um, but then because of, of loss in materials and in things like that, they you can't hold on to them for all that long. So if you want to transmit them over optical fiber, you can go about 15 kilometers, which corresponds to about 75 microseconds, before you have a 50% chance of losing your photon, and it gets exponentially worse as you go farther. It turns out if you live on a, on a photonic chip, which is often what you would like to do to do a whole bunch of quantum information processing on your chip, um, the loss is so much worse, um, and the kinds of delays that you can achieve on your chip is, is really more in the nanosecond regime. Um, and then anytime you have an interface getting in and out of fiber, getting on and off of chip, those also tend to be lossy as well. So this is a slightly different problem than some of the more typical problems we have with qubits based on atoms or ions where, you know, okay, yeah, we sometimes lose our atoms, our ions, but we have much bigger problems than that that occur faster. They decohere and things like that. Photons don't decohere, um, but we do lose them a lot. 
There's another major problem, and that's that photons don't interact with each other. And so the way that we build up quantum systems, um, and we do quantum gates in, in either a kind of discrete quantum computing sense or in a, in a quantum simulation sense, whatever it is, I need the things that are acting like qubits to interact with each other to be able to entangle them. I base my entanglement on some kind of interaction, a Coulomb interaction, a Van der Waals interaction, whatever your favorite interaction is, and there's nothing with photons. They do not interact with each other, so there isn't really any obvious way um, to entanglement. We're going to talk about how we get around that, but, but it's, 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 a, it's a fundamental issue with light. Um, and then there's the fact that they also don't really interact that much with other stuff either. Um, basically, the point is that in the end, it, we are going to mediate their interactions with, with quantum emitters or atoms. Um, but even that is that native interaction is, is pretty weak, right? The fine structure constant is small. Um, the, the, the odds of a single atom and a single photon interacting if they encounter each other is extremely small. Um, all right. So quantum emitters are going to help with all of these things. So what are they going to help with? So they're going to help with this fact that we lose photons. Um, so quantum emitters are going to let us store light um, usually in kind of an ensemble of them. The little cartoon at the bottom here is, uh, you know, the cartoon of what happens. I send light into an ensemble. It hangs out there for some amount of time, and I get it at a later time. Um, and this is useful for long times um, in order to, to send light some long distance and come back again, right, a kind of a millisecond or longer time scale in order to do something in some large quantum network. This is also useful for short times if I can do it on a photonic chip, um, because like I said, delays on photonic chips, um, very challenging to make them very long at all. And if I'm trying to, to route some quantum information on a chip, I, I, maybe in just in order to synchronize it or to wait until one thing is done to do another thing, I gotta hold on to my photonic qubit for some amount of time. Quantum emitters are also gonna be useful for this entanglement generation problem. So if I, I have an emitter and I, it has some nice internal states, like an atom's uh, hyperfine levels, that can remain nice and coherent, and I can get this thing to emit a photon that's entangled with that internal state, right? this kind of spin photon entanglement generation um, is extremely useful for generating these long distance um, entanglement links. And, and I can do even better if I can couple that emitter to, say, an optical cavity or to some other spins or things like this. And then it also turns out that, that, that these kinds of nice coherent emitters can be used for things like microwave to optical conversion. I can use an ensemble of them as a thing to, to kind of convert a microwave photon into an optical photon, which is a big challenge. If I want to connect my superconducting qubit quantum computer into my quantum network, I somehow have to turn those microwaves into something that I can send over my channel. Um, and they can also be useful for um, quantum sensing, which is really not what I'm, I'm talking about today, but um, the, you know, many, many nice coherent quantum emitters, they also make good, good sensors of magnetic fields or electric fields or strain or whatever. Um, and uh, so that's kind of an aside that I won't really talk much about. And so like I said, and maybe like the title of my talk hinted at, I'm not going to talk about real atoms today. Um, I'm going to focus on um, emitters that live inside of solid state systems. Um, and this is VAMOS. Most people probably are more familiar with, you know, rubidium and vacuum than they are with, with the kinds of systems that I'm going to talk about. Um, the, the reasons why we're interested in moving into a slightly different system than our typical atomic physics systems, um, the big ones are getting kind of direct coupling to photonic structures. So really getting the light in and out of my, my atomic system with high efficiency, which is very hard to do if my atoms live in vacuum, because how do I how do I get the, the structure that I need to really get get the get the light out with high efficiency? If I live inside of a solid, I can I can actually fabricate whatever my photonic structure that I want is right on top of where my atoms are. I can also pack them in much more than I can do with with atoms. The, in fact, the systems some of the systems I'm going to talk about today have uh, densities of emitters that are kind of 10 to the 22 per centimeter cubed. Um, so, so we can get just very, very, very high density of emitters, which is good for making compact and scalable devices. There's also kind of a sense of manufacturability that you get or engineerability that you get when you, when you live in solids and you're not just limited to the periodic table. Um, but we also have some major drawbacks. So now that our emitters don't live in vacuum, they're not in general going to be identical to each other. We don't get that for free anymore like we do in a, 
in a typical atom and vacuum system. Um, and there's just other stuff going on all over spins and charges and whatnot um, that give us all sorts of extra dephasing and decoherence um, that we don't want and that we don't usually have to deal with in, in real atomic systems. So what's our wish list um, for finding um, these kind of solid state quantum emitters? Well, we want them as identical as possible. This isn't always going to be the case. Um, but we want them as identical as possible, so we want a kind of host material that doesn't have a lot going on, that's going to going to going to cause some changing of electric and magnetic fields at our at our emitter or anything else like that. Um, and we want an emitter that's kind of isolated from its host. Those are two sides of the same right, discussion. We want to be able to integrate them into photonic structures, right? So we want, and I'm going to talk more about this. We want small and very high quality photonic structures to do the things that we're going to want to do. And so we want to live in a material that has well-developed kind of commercial nanofabric nanofabrication capabilities so that I can do this. It would be nice if we also had nice, really, really coherent spin qubits, um, like hyperfine states or something like that, something that's got a nuclear spin in it, so it's going to stay nice and coherent. And then we want, you know, other things too. If we can get them, we it would be great if we had other spins nearby so we can start to do kind of interactions between between different spins. It would be great if we knew where they were or could control where they were. This is a big open problem. Then other things that we would like, you know, if it could operate in the telecom band, so the, the frequency range of light where optical fiber is the lowest loss. And so I can, I can, I can actually get 75 microseconds in fiber and I'm not limited to some even shorter amount of time in fiber and then various other things. So let's talk a little bit um, about these these things. So, so why do we need them to be identical? Why do I care that the that the emitter emits the same photon every time? So this is a little bit of an aside. Uh, probably most of you know this, but uh, for those of you who are real atomic physicists and maybe haven't thought about Hong Mandel interference before, here's just a quick primer. So it turns out that um, if you have identical photons and they are incident on a beam splitter, so something that's like a half silvered mirror, they each have a 50% probability of being reflected and transmitted, um, but you, your beam splitter transformations give you a very specific um, phase that you get upon reflection or transmission. And it turns out if and only if your photons are identical in every degree of freedom, they will always stick together on the output. They will never go opposite directions. Um, on the output, you get a cancellation of the, of the, the two terms in the middle. Um, if the photons are exactly identical. If they're not identical, then these two terms are not the same and they don't cancel. So this was first demonstrated in, in the 80s where this, this reduction in coincidences was seen as they varied uh, what in that case was the arrival time of the photons so that making them identical in their longitudinal wave function when they overlapped and then not identical again as they went apart. And importantly, you know, this only works if they're identical in every single degree of freedom. But this is the thing that allows all quantum networking to happen. So if my photons aren't identical, I can't do any of the things that I said on that first slide for building a quantum network. Because I cannot do the, the basic entanglement swapping that I need to do in order to establish that entanglement. That is to say, let's say I have two spins and they each emit a photon that's entangled with the internal state of the spin. And I would like to, to map that entanglement so that it's between the two spins. What I do is I need to make a Bell state measurement on the photons, um, which I'm not going to explain, but the Bell state measurement requires Hong Mandel interference, right? I have to project those two photons into an entangled state of the photons, and that will not happen if they are not indistinguishable, if they do not interfere this way. If they are indistinguishable and they do interfere this way, the world opens up to me. I can not only do these entanglement swapping things, I can also do more complicated things. I can make much more complicated Bell state measurements that actually build up these graph states like I was mentioning earlier on. In fact, it's been known for 20 years that with just photons, I can build a whole quantum computer. Um, with just photons and these kinds of, of schemes, I can build a whole quantum computer with, with photon number resolving detectors. The problem is the number of photons I would need as well out of reach of the number of photons that I can make. But in theory, it would be possible. Okay, so that's why we need them to be identical. Why do we need to be able to integrate them into these small structures? So why would I want to put an atom into a cavity? So when we when we put an atom into a cavity or a spin into a cavity, we we talk about three quantities um, related to that system. There's there's the rate at which the atom will decay and emit a photon into free space, gamma. There's the rate at which the atom is kind of coupled to the cavity, so the, the, the thing that's parameterizing the coupling between the atom and the cavity mode. Then there's the, the decay rate of the cavity, kappa. 
I was aligned with the cavity. We're going to talk about the bad cavity limit because for this kind of system, that's what we always care about. Um, so the bad cavity limit is where kappa is bigger than g is bigger than gamma. So what we really want is we want um, the atom to mostly emit into the cavity and not to emit in other directions. And then once the photon gets in the cavity, we want it to come out. So we want to use this as a source of single photons that are entangled with the internal state of the atom. And we get what's called a Purcell enhancement, if we do this well, um, where we actually speed up the rate at which the atom emits because this, this coupling is large. So our emission comes out faster, um, and it increases the amount of emission that goes into our desired mode, so into the spatial mode of the cavity. But also, if there are lots of possible decay channels, the cavity is only enhancing one of them, and so it also comes out in the spectral mode that we care about, in any other mode um, that we also care about. So this is really important, especially with uh, solid state emitters, where there are often lots of other channels that we can come out at. It's also important for real atoms as well, just because it's hard to collect a photon from an atom if it's getting spit out in every possible direction. For us, that is the people who work with solid state emitters, it's also extra important because usually our, our, our systems aren't perfectly clean. So there are some charges and some spins in our system that are flipping or moving or whatever that cause a little bit of excess dephasing of our emitter. That is, there's a little bit of jitter during the emission of the local electric or magnetic field right at our emitter, which appears as broadening of the emitter emission. That is to say, the photon that comes out in the blue case, where it's not enhanced, right, is not perfectly transform limited. So the bandwidth is a little bit bigger than you would expect given the lifetime. But if I can speed the emission up, and so I get the red curve in time, that also means I broaden it. So I get the red curve in frequency as well. And I can kind of broaden away at least some amount of this bad stuff um, that I get in my solid state system. And the way to get this well is to make uh, a system that has a very high quality factor, so basically a cavity with very low optical losses, that's very, very, very small. Because the quantity that I care about is the quality factor divided by the mode volume. And this basically requires the ability to make good, teeny, tiny cavities. Um, and so this is why it's important to be hosted in a material where I can make good, teeny, tiny cavities. And it turns out, even if I can't make good, teeny, tiny cavities, if, even, if I can't make, if, even if I'm in the very bad cavity limit, um, where I just put a cavity, but my coupling isn't so much, so I don't really get a Purcell enhancement, even this actually helps with directing the emission. Um, and so kind of any kind of nanofabrication that I can do is a big benefit for me. All right. Optically addressable spin qubits, this is another thing that we said was important. So the reason for this is because many, many of the ways that we would like to do um, quantum memory, where we would like to take a photon and store it in an ensemble of emitters and then get it back out again, um, uses these spin qubits. So, so there are lots of different protocols for doing what I've drawn as this. I have a photon, I map it into a collective atomic state, and then I get it back out again at a later time. Many of those, oh, sorry, so the, so the primary metrics that we should talk about for these protocols are how long can I store the photon for, how often do I get it back out again, and for communication, really, bandwidth is something you should always be uh, accounting for. What, what bandwidth the photon? Because if, if I can make the world's best quantum memory, but it only stores a photon that's, you know, a few kilohertz wide, not really going to be able to use that for almost anything. So many of the, of the protocols for making quantum memories that have the longest storage times um, are some kind of two-photon protocol that stores the photon as a collective spin wave excitation on some low-lying spin state. So electromagnetically induced transparency and things like electromagnetically induced transparency, right? Um, and so this is why we would like to have some spin qubit um, that's often highly coherent that is coupled to some optical transitions to let us do these kinds of, of, of quantum memory protocols, which Lindsay is really the expert on here. There are some other ones as well where we don't actually need the spin qubit. Um, and so this is, this is going to be particularly relevant for what I'm going to talk about today, um, because it turns out with certain emitters where um, the optical transition can actually be kind of reasonably long-lived and, and reasonably coherent, you can actually store a photon as a collective excitation on just your optical two-level system using, say, an atomic frequency comb protocol, which I'll, I'll mention briefly again later, but it basically allows you um, to make a, a, a preset delay line um, for a photon. And, then, and the nice thing about this 
um, is that this protocol is very simple to implement and, and typically has kind of the largest efficiency and bandwidth of, of any kind of quantum memory protocol you can make. So this will this will come back later. All right, and so the other things that we want, right, I mentioned before, um, but this was going to be where I was going to break for questions before I get into kind of the meat of everything, if anyone had questions on the introduction. All right, well, let me just remind everyone you can use the Q&A feature in Zoom and the chat in YouTube. Um, and there's none from the audience yet, but please do add some. Um, maybe sort of a speculative question for me is, um, you know, we you talked about the you know inability to use microwave photons, which are in radiation, and we do use optical photons. Is there sort of a limit in there besides just the argument of well, telecom fits into fibers, and so we use that. But is there another you know um, optimization one can think about in terms of wavelengths for quantum networking that we could consider? Yeah, I mean that's a, it's a really interesting question, right? We we use we we usually use telecom you know photons in the the C band or the O band or somewhere near there. Um, just because we can send them over fiber, but if your if your network isn't in fiber, if it's in free space, then there are other considerations, right? Um, if you're going up to satellites, for instance, then what you actually care about are the windows where the atmosphere is um, the most transparent. Um, and also, longer wavelengths are better because they're less susceptible to atmospheric turbulence. Because if there's a if there's a characteristic length mm -hmm. scale for something going on the longer wavelengths the photon is, the less sensitive it is to whatever that thing is, right? Um, until you start to hit the black, you know, the limit where you have black body background. Um, but no, I think that for, you know, we do telecom because that's what Corning gave us, but. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I mean, and the manufacturability, I guess, is, it comes back into this as well. Um, another question from Jonathan about the cavity. Uh, it helps with the spectral identicality of photons, but does it make uh, achieving time identicality more difficult? Or is that an issue? Huh, interesting. That's a good question. Um, I don't, right, I think that that's just going to depend on your, on the control side more, right? As long as you can excite the thing much, much faster than it emits, even in the Purcell enhanced regime, then I think you're fine, right? That should be right. Uh, a question from the audience here, maybe possibly the last one before we move on. Uh, with the materials here, can we see these same phenomena at higher temperatures or do you need cryogenic temperatures uh, to do this kind of work? Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll repeat myself later, but um, for, for quantum networking applications where I need these identical photons, if my emitter lives in a solid, I'm never going to get identical photons out at room temperature, right? Because at room temperature, there are there's a phonon population in the material. And so on the way out, I can grab a phonon from the material that can cause uh, some jitter in the energy on my photon. Um, now, if I'm using this as a quantum sensor and it's the spin that's sensing something and then light is just letting me read out the spin state and I'm not actually using the photon in a quantum network, it doesn't have to be identical. And then I can do it at room temperature. And that's why NV quantum sensors work at room temperature. Yeah. But in terms of single photon sources that are suitable for quantum networks, unless you can get such a Purcell enhancement that you're going to broaden away the phonon broadening, which is typically very large at room temperature, I don't think there's any hope of, of, of operating at room temperature. And the only kind of Purcell enhancement you can even imagine getting large enough, I think, to broaden that away is probably plasmonic. And then you're bringing in other problems. Okay. All right. Well, let's move on for now, and we can take some more questions Great. later. Excellent. Okay. So that was all abstract, and I didn't talk about anything. Um, and so now I'm going to give talk about a few different kinds of, of solid state um, quantum emitters, um, and then, then get to the one that we're going to talk about today. So I apologize in advance if I don't mention your favorite. Um, so. After our wish list that we just saw, you should say, oh, you should put something in silicon, right? Silicon is great. It's going to be by far the quietest host. You can grow it with almost no defects. It, you can make it with no nuclear spins. You can do great nanofab, the best nanofabrication in it, right? Um, and you're right, we should put things in silicon, but the problem is things don't like to be in silicon. And so there, 
there there's a very long history of people trying to to make or find really you know good emitters in silicon there's some really exciting recent progress on a few different things that that but it's very very recent um and it just turns out silicon it, for all of its great properties it doesn't love to host um, emitters okay so what can we do what's the next best thing to do nanofabrication in um is is three five materials right um things like gallium arsenide whatever aluminum nitride pick your favorite um you can make efficient single photon sources um in these two you can get good emitters in those so like mbe grown quantum dots and things along those lines um but these are not quiet hosts these are the opposite of quiet hosts so your three five materials you always are just full of nuclear spins everywhere nuclear spins Plus the way you're making these emitters, in particular with quantum dots, these MBE grown quantum dots, there's a huge amount of, of inhomogeneity, so difference between each dot because you're kind of growing it as this little island and it's it's certainly not a single atom that has any hope of being identical to some other one. Um, I mean, there is very good recent progress reducing some of these issues, the charge noise, the spectral diffusion, and the dephasing. And again, the integration is the best. So people have made, have made so single photon sources based on quantum dots that now have collection efficiencies even into single mode optical fiber, I think well above 50%, maybe about 50%. Um, but because the spin lifetimes are so short, there are a lot, you're kind of limited in what you can imagine doing with these. You're never really going to have some super long lived spin state inside of a quantum dot, at least in a 3.5. So then we get to nitrogen vacancy centers and all of the other various color centers in diamond and silicon carbide, which is very similar to diamond in this way. These are the gold standard today um, in, for, for quantum emitters in solid state hosts. The host is almost as good as silicon in terms of its quietness um, and the fact that it can be nuclear spin free and nearly defect free, et cetera, et cetera. Nanofabrication is not like silicon, um, but people have made some great progress on, on making um, better nanofabricated devices in diamond and in silicon carbide. And, and, um, and so this is, what, this is what a lot of people are working on, but it's not what I'm gonna talk about today. So what I do in my group is a little bit different. We actually investigate rare earth atoms um, that live inside of solids. And uh, we're, we're, we're actually taking the opposite tack of the, the, um, the color center folks. Um, we're taking advantage not of the host being particularly good, but instead of the emitter being particularly good. And we'll see what some of the benefits are of that. There are a, a few other benefits of the system, not just that we can make really nice, pretty pictures in it, um, uh, but also that there's a really long history in classical optics um, of using rare earth atoms in solids. You know, anyone who has a green laser pointer sitting on your desk right now, you've got a rare earth doped solid sitting on your desk right now. Um, so people have been using these for many, many things for, for many, many years, which, which helps as well. So, okay. Why rare earth atoms in solids? These are the rare earth atoms in case you weren't aware. The lanthanides, I use them interchangeably, even though I think there are a few that fall under one category and maybe not under the other. They're kind of the most atom-like of all of the solid state emitters. Everything I'm going to talk about is at 4 Kelvin, just to be clear. Um, and this is because of this picture. So the picture, the plot that I have here, is the radial wave function as a function of distance from the nucleus of the relevant orbitals. So the relevant ones are the 4f and the 5s and the 5p. And the 4f orbital is the one that's partially full um, as I go across this road, the 5s and the 5p have already been filled previously. And so what this means is that the electrons that are doing all the physics in this system, they all live in this 4f orbital. And in fact, all of the transitions we're going to be interested in are, are spin orbit transitions. So the electrons are really going to basically stay within the 4f orbital. And they are shielded from their environment by these full and closed 5s and 5p. And so that shielding just minimizes the effect of the environment on these guys and to, to an extent that's not possible using basically any other type of, of emitter in a solid. So they are, instead of making the host very, very quiet, we pick an emitter that's the minimally sensitive to the host. So this means that they reach, they can, you can pack them in at these very high densities because they still act like little isolated atoms even when they get close to each other or close to other hosts. It also means I can host them in lots and lots of different solids without really having to worry about, you know, the small variations in what happens. The, the host is somewhat of a perturbation, at least in some regimes. And what it results in 
is super long coherence times. So the optical transitions um, have coherence times of milliseconds, and the spin transitions have been shown to have coherence times of hours um, in, in certain of these species. And that's really what's so exciting, right? So basically, the, the minimal effect of the host um, is kind of good for everything. It's good for the homogeneity. It's good for the coherence. The high densities that we can get are good for making efficient devices and compact devices. So I can get high optical densities, and I can also make a nice little device. The fact that I can host them in lots of different solids is good for photonic integration, right? It means I can choose materials. Unfortunately, silicon's still hard, but 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 the people are working on it. Um, but I can I can pick a material that maybe I like better for for integrating um, into systems. And then these long coherence times are just good for everything. And that's that's kind of the reason why we look at these things because they have these super long coherence times. So why doesn't everyone work with rare earth atoms and solids? Well, okay, there are a lot of drawbacks too. So there are these highly multi-electron atoms in general, um, right? As we go along, then you've got starting one at one electron with cerium up to 13 with ytterbium. Um, and so there's actually a ton of levels in here. And then we go into this highly anisotropic environment in the crystal field which further splits the levels, which we need because we would like to, to, to have, that's actually giving us a lot of our coherence, but it means we got way more levels now in here. Um, and in fact, the transitions that we're interested in, I mentioned their spin orbit transitions because these are very heavy atoms. Um, they're only weakly allowed um, in the crystal. They're actually not allowed in free space. They're weakly allowed by the small perturbation that the crystal puts on it. So the line widths of our optical transitions tend to be below a kilohertz. Um, and so it's not like an NV center where I have my diamond chip and I put a microscope objective down and I shine some green light in and I get red light out, right? And I can scan it around and I can even see just one, right? I can get enough counts out of a single NV center to see it. If I did this with my sample, my count rate would be well below what I could detect with any reasonable system. Right? Furthermore, they are more homogeneous than basically any other solid state emitter, that is, there is less variation in the optical energy, the, the, the excitation energy, compared to all the other solid state emitters. But there's still enough to be a problem. So the, the spread in the emission energy does is larger than the longest lived of the hyperfine or nuclear spin states. That is, if I have an ensemble of, of europium atoms, which are the ones with the longest um, spin coherence times, I cannot resolve the transitions with the super long coherence times in the entire ensemble because of the site to site difference in the um, emitter energy. If you're an atomic physics person, which many of you probably are, it's like if my Doppler broadened vapor cell of rubidium, the Doppler broadening was bigger than the hyperfine splitting. So I wouldn't be able to see the different peaks due to the different hyperfine states in rubidium. Okay, so what are we going to do? So given the fact that emission is weak and often on the wrong transition, um, we can kind of do two things. We can either use lots and lots and lots of atoms to just get up the light matter interaction, which is what we're going to do for quantum memory. Unfortunately, we can pack them in, and so that's pretty good. Um, or we're going to couple them to waveguides and resonators, which was the whole point of going solid state in the first place. So we wanted to do that anyway. So great. In this case, the fact that for the really, really long-lived spin transitions, we can't resolve them in bulk, what this means today is that we have to, there's a, there's a trade-off between using the long-lived spin states to build like a long-lived quantum memory or using all of the atoms to build a much shorter quantum memory, but taking advantage of all of the atoms, having all the optical depth and all of the bandwidth. Right? Um, and so this, this, we're also going to talk about this trade-off a little bit. So in my group, we're pursuing um, a variety of different approaches. Um, we are looking at reducing the optical inhomogeneity in order to uh, get rid of that trade-off there. Um, and then we're also looking at, at new, new host materials for easier photonic integration. Um, so bef I was going to break again, though. It maybe seems like I just broke. I'm not sure um, for questions. Are there any questions? I, can, I, was, I, have, I had one more break written in, so we can skip this one if there are no questions at this point. Yeah, why don't we keep going and then we'll... Yeah. yeah. All right. So... Uh, right, so new materials for reducing that optical inhomogeneity and resolving those spin states. So I said each each of our emitters uh, has a slightly different energy, and this causes a problem, right? Unlike atoms, rubidium atoms in vacuum, or pick your favorite atom in vacuum, right? Our environment is not identical at each emitter. So each emitter lives in 
say this solid state matrix and due to the 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 distance to the neighbors being slightly different say for each emitter the electric field at the emitter is also different and thus its energy is different um and this is this seems to be dominated in the in the case of the rare earth atoms by by effectively point defects so there's an atom missing and that kind of shifts the lattice just a little bit locally or there's the wrong atom in there and that shifts the lattice a little bit locally and the the most common point defect in a rare earth doped crystal like say your ropium doped yttrium orthosilicate which is i think what this picture is of um the most common point defect in a rare earth doped crystal is the rare earth that's doping the crystal and substituting for the yttrium um and because it's a different size europium is not exactly the same size as yttrium it's close but it's not identical and so these different dopants they 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 come along in different parts of the inhomogeneously broadened line but each one is very narrow and very coherent right so how how do i reduce this inhomogeneity well i could reduce my doping concentration because it's really not the dopant itself that's the problem it's the microscopic configuration of all of the other dopants that's different for each one but if i reduce my doping concentration i also reduce my number of atoms and that's not what i want to do but what if i go to a hundred percent doping so a few years ago um I, I guess several years ago now um it was shown in a crystal that is stoichiometric in the in the rare earth atom of interest europium um that you can get this reduction in the inhomogeneous line width by making it so that the crystal is now identical. There is no doping. So there are still defects in the crystal and things like that. And the defects do cause some residual inhomogeneous broadening, but the biggest source of inhomogeneous broadening, the doping itself is now gone. The problem is you still need the atoms to be kind of far apart for them to still be acting like individual atoms, right? I said that you can get them close together because of the shielding effect and act like individual atoms, but I can't get them infinitely <laughs> close together. Um, so I need them on a solid state scale. I still need them, say, five, maybe preferably closer to 10 angstroms apart so that they're still acting kind of like atoms in vacuum, kind of like, like individually addressable atoms that don't know that each other exists. And there are only so many crystals in the world that you can grow where the nearest neighbor spacing between the metal is, is, is this big. This is big on a solid state um, scale. And so... This is kind of a mix of uh, some data mining, some theory, some growth, and some characterization, um, a project I've been working on with Daniel Shoemaker, who's in our, our materials uh, science and engineering department here at Illinois. Um, we're focusing on europium for a variety of reasons. It's the one with the best coherence properties, among other reasons. And we're trying to find and grow and characterize materials that have kind of large nearest neighbor europium, europium spacing, and ones where we can synthesize relatively simply the material that we want in, in kind of a, a large enough and you know to work with low defect because we don't want other defects crystal that um, is also environmentally stable because it turns out this work which was awesome um, those crystals uh, are hygroscopic um, and so they're not convenient to work with we would like if we're gonna if we're gonna go through all the things we can make we would like to also pick something that that can last in air or vacuum um, so uh, our Initial work, we picked two things um, that we studied, and they're in the, the paper referenced at the bottom. These are both um, metal organic frameworks that can be grown by solution precipitation. So basically, put a bunch of stuff in solution, you heat it up, and you, you heat it up, uh, well, you supersaturate the solution, then you heat it up so everything dissolves, and then you cool it down slowly and it falls out. So if you've grown crystals at home, this is how you grew crystals at home um, as a kid. And uh, we picked these two for a variety of reasons. One, there were papers in the literature about how to grow them. Um, and two, they had kind of different nearest neighbor um, European or open distances. And so we thought we could start to study that. So we went about growing them and we were able to grow them, although we were only really able to grow large crystals of the formate formamide, whereas the crystals that we could grow of the just formate um, were quite a bit smaller, as you can see from our pictures. But you know, we can do x-ray diffraction and show that we've grown the thing that we think we've grown. Uh, so that was, you know, a good first step. Um, and then the first thing to do is just photoluminescence um, to determine that, you know, we're full of europium and it does the things, the europium things that we would like it to do. We haven't done something crazy with the europium. So anyone who's not familiar with photoluminescence, I have my material. It's got all sorts of levels. I hit it with light that's in the blue or even in the UV. 
this is a real color picture of us doing photoluminescence on a sample, by the way. Um, there is non-radiative relaxation to some level, and then I get light out on a variety of transitions, um, making their way slowly down to the ground state. Like I said, we've got a million levels in the system. There, there are a bunch in here we haven't even drawn. Um, so these different levels as well um, are where uh, we see all of these various colors. And so we can do that and we can see, okay, great. Um, we see the transitions we expect to make. So all the non-radiative decay should come to this lowest level of this 5D manifold, and then it should fall down to all the various levels of this ground uh, uh, 7F manifold. Um, and we see the one all the way down to the ground state, um, which means something about the symmetry of the crystal and that we've done the right thing and that we've grown the right thing. And we see the other things that we can identify. Yes, this is europium and we're not crazy. Um, and this is in the paper at the bottom, but we've at this point started to look at some other materials too, including a, a, a europium aluminum borate, which is not a MOF. It's a slightly different kind of material. And we can do the same photoluminescence and, and see its peak. So, so this is the first thing we can do. And we can do it cryogenically where the peaks get nice and small. All right, so the next thing is, is are these acting at least somewhat like isolated atoms? Do they have the long lifetime that you expect um, from a rare earth atom in a crystal, or have we shortened up the lifetime substantially by, by making them at this very high density? And so we can just count the photons that come out, give it a short pulse, and look at the light that comes out and watch the lifetime. And we, we see the kind of millisecond scale or longer than millisecond scale lifetimes um, that we expect from rare earth atoms. So just for all of the AMO people, right, this is really long um, and kind of cool, right? These are the, the optical lifetimes in our systems are all in this kind of millisecond um, time range, right? And that's great. That means, okay, so far so good. Um, you know, these are similar to what we get um, in the doped materials where the density is much, much lower. Um, and, you know, this doesn't, this doesn't tell us that we have the long coherence times um, because we don't necessarily are not necessarily radiative lifetime limited. There are lots of other things that can decohere our atoms. That's not just the decay like you have in, in, your, in your rubidium system. So we need to measure the other things as well. So let's start by trying to measure that inhomogeneous broadening that we were, that was the whole thing we were trying to, to reduce, right? Um, so to do that, we do not photoluminescence, but photoluminescence excitation. So here we use a narrow band laser, which we can scan across where we believe the transition to be. And then we block that laser and collect all of the red shifted emission that comes out on those other, other nearby lines because we've got this highly multi-level system. So now we have our, our yellow CW laser that we can scan across our 580 nanometer transition, that one we saw in photoluminescence. And then we can look at how many counts we get on all of these other decay channels. And we can do this. These are hot off the presses. I pulled these out of the lab notebook this morning from the student who's been doing this. Um, we can do this and we can get kind of measures based on how far we can scan our laser um, of the, the um, three different materials that we're investigating. So we'll see the narrowest one we've gotten is about four gigahertz. I'll say the doped materials um, are about one to 10 gigahertz. Um, so we have not yet reduced the inhomogeneous broadening over what you expect from the dope materials with our kind of 4 gigahertz, 10 gigahertz, 10 gigahertz kinds of, of lines here. However, what we have done is we've made things with inhomogeneity that's comparable to samples where our density is a thousand times larger or lower, right? Um, because we are not doped. These are stoichiometric materials. They do have europium in every site. Um, and the x-ray diffraction told us that we have made the thing that we we have made. And so, you know, what, what we need to do now is, is, is we need to, to make better crystals that have, you know, fewer defects. So these, these crystals don't have the defect associated with the doping in them, but they presumably have lots of other defects. You can even see on the borate here um, that it's like transparent at the top and there's some, it looks like some crud on the bottom. So this one was, was grown not in the same solution precipitation way as the other ones, um, but it's called flux growth. Um, and uh, so it's grown in a solution that can be superheated um, compared, and that's still stuck on the outside. So the next things to do here um, are uh, spectral hole burning to really start making measurements of this system, observing the hyperfine structure in the spin lifetime. Um, and then we want to measure the coherence properties, so we got to do some echo measurements. 
we're going to look at growing the crystals with fewer defects, um, and then we're going to continue to identify and synthesize other materials um, that would be uh, good candidates. Um, so this means some, some data mining and some DFT and some other things like that. All right, this is where I'd break three, but I'm almost out of time. Very good. Um, yeah, there are a few questions here. Um, yeah, there was, well, a very general question. Um, could these types of uh, about quantum sensing, um, are there space applications for some of the kinds of sensors that you're thinking about? Space applications? Yes. Oh, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, maybe, right? I mean, so like, I can imagine maybe you might want to do, there might be reasons to try and do like axion detection in space. Um, right, where you're, you're trying to detect dark matter um, without the background of all of the stuff happening on Earth. That's the only one that comes to mind. Uh, oh, but also entangled networks of clocks. So yes, so I mean, there's a big application which is if I can entangle a bunch of clocks and a bunch of satellites around the Earth, uh, I can do all sorts of things. <laughs> sure, yeah. Um, with relationship to one of the last things you're saying here, um, at the doping densities you're talking about, if I think about gas phase atoms with electric dipole transitions, I would expect enormous dipole-dipole interactions as well as super radiance effects. Are those kinds of things going on here? Great question. So the dipole-dipole interactions are almost, they're, they're small, very small um, at the densities we're talking about with europium. There's a reason why I'm not doing with this with erbium because they would be larger. So europium, um, the states that I'm interested in have no electric, electronic spin, or at least almost no electronic spin. They're basically nuclear spin states. And so they're, they don't see each other. Um, there are interactions where kind of I can get a shift interaction where I excite one atom and it'll shift its, its neighbors. Um, those are actually useful if I want to say entangle these guys. Um, super radiance is another good question. So because they're not identical and what you need for super radiance is, is uh, more than one identical emitter per every lambda cubed volume. Our standard samples don't have it at the densities we're talking about, though, if we can compress the inhomogeneous broadening and make them more identical, I do expect to be able to see super radiance, which is something I am very excited about. Great. Yeah, there's a lot of excitement about that in general right now. So it'd be great to see. Um, and another question about the photoluminescence spectra on the J to zero to J to zero transition of interest. It looks less sharp than some of the other transitions. Is there a reason for that? Yeah, um, I, I don't think it's necessarily less sharp. It's just much smaller because you just said it's J to zero to J to zero. So everyone who's taken atomic physics in the audience, is that allowed? I'm teaching atomic physics this semester. <laughs> um, right, that's the transition is doubly forbidden actually in Europium. Um, and it's it's only allowed because where you've, there's some mixing that's happening in there with the crystal. Um, so I'm not sure it's actually broader. I think it's actually just smaller. Very fair enough. Um, and a question from Neil Clausen in the audience. You mentioned data mining. Do you mean searching the chemistry literature? And is that helpful for finding stoichiometric crystals that might have better properties? Yeah, it's hard though, um, right? There are these crystal databases. I'm learning all this stuff. There's all these crystal databases, databases um, full of materials that people have grown. And then there's kind of very gap filled literature about how to grow them and what one should do. And yes, there's a student who, who is doing this, a material science student. Um, and then he's, he's, so he's not only searching the literature for things people have grown that meet, we might want to try, but also things people have grown, not with europium, but with terbium or pick your other, pick another rare earth atom. And then he does DFT to see if we can grow it with europium. And then we try and do that. Yeah. All right. Well, let's let you finish up here. And then um, if there's any last questions at the end, we can do that as, again. Uh, great. So I'm going to skip the next section. Um, and just do a brief discussion of um, looking in new materials, new host materials for photonic integration. I'll go through this real quick. So this is a collaboration with the group of Vito Wax um, back at Maryland, where I was before. So basically what we're looking at is rare earth atoms in, in LNOI, thin film lithium niobate on insulator, which is a really exciting new platform for lots of things um, because it allows you to do um, nanofabrication in lithium niobate that wasn't previously possible before you could achieve these very thin films of lithium niobate. Um, and it makes you, lets you make much, much um, tighter confinement, much smaller, well-defined features um, on lithium niobate. Um, and so we have some thulium doped um, lithium niobate in which we fabricated waveguides. Um, 
so 300 nanometers worth of thulium on top of, of, of oxide and, and silicon for the fabrication. And what we started with is we just looked at the various properties of the, of the thulium, it's a different rare earth atom, um, in the lithium nitamine and compared it to the bulk. Um, and so we could see that the lifetime was comparable to the bulk. Um, you will, if you've been paying attention, thulium, um, especially thulium and lithium nibate, is not nearly as coherent as europium in anything. So these lifetimes are order of magnitude or two shorter than those europium lifetimes, but still long on, a, on an atomic physics um, scale. Um, we looked at burning spectral holes, so basically optically pumping atoms um, out of a certain region, which is kind of telling you about the, the homogeneous line width of of the atom, how 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 resolved you can get with your with your laser coming in, um, and then we also did a photon echo experiment on the optical transition to measure the the, the coherence time of that of that optical transition um, directly. And in all these cases, we observed there was no deviation um, from the bulk parameters, and so that was that was to start with very exciting. We with the right annealing and everything after the nanofabrication, we can we can regain the properties we had. This is not always the case with solid state emitters. They often get very unhappy when you do nanofabrication in your system or when they get very close to the surface of your system. Um, um, and so then we went in to actually show kind of a basic quantum memory protocol in our system. So like I, I mentioned much earlier, um, the atomic frequency comb quantum memory. So this is where uh, you come in and you, you use a laser um, to optically pump, selectively, spectrally, optically pump your atoms. Like I said, you've got this inhomogeneous broadening, and now we're taking advantage of it. So you've got this inhomogeneous broadening and that, and that we're taking advantage of, and we're coming in, and we're selectively removing the atoms at certain shift classes and leaving the ones in other shift classes to make this comb structure out of the atoms. And now we come in with an input pulse that covers many, many comb teeth, and it gets absorbed into a a collective state of all of the atoms across all of these teeth. And it turns out that it gets absorbed. And then as you get dephasing between the atoms that have different, um, different shifts, uh, they all rephase at a time equal to one over the splitting between these teeth. You can work this out um, if you're interested. And so it's basically like a delay line where you've prefixed the time of the delay because you've chosen the comb that you're going to burn. So we burned a comb. Um, our comb wasn't great. This background is the way we were measuring the comb. That's not really there. But you know, you can see our finesse of our comb is kind of about one. That is to say, the, the width of the comb teeth compared to the splitting. But that's good enough to do um, some storage. Uh, we should be able to do much better if we put this in a cavity. It's only in a waveguide right now. And then we can show that we can store with very low efficiency. Um, light with different combs, so we can burn a comb with a storage time written in of 90, mic 90 nanoseconds and then all the way out to about 250 nanoseconds. If you were paying attention on the slide previous, I said that the, the T2 time, the coherence time of the thulium should be out close to a microsecond, right? But we can't show storage all the way out there. You, you'll also, you would also might complain to me that this looks like it, it's not really exponential, or if it is exponential, the decay time is very, very short. In fact, what's limiting our storage here is uh, this is the best comb we could make. Uh, as we try and make combs with longer storage times, the comb gets worse. Um, and so, in fact, that decreases our storage efficiency because our comb isn't as good. Um, so this was just, again, just in a waveguide just to show the initial stuff. But uh, if you can do this in an impedance-matched cavity, so you make a little ring waveguide that makes a cavity, all of a sudden everything gets much better. You can pump your atoms much faster. You get much more optical depth for your storage. Um, everything should improve, and we should probably also shift to rare species that are not thulium, um, which do have these longer native um, coherence times. But there was already a lot of work in the literature on thulium. It has some benefits. Um, so that's what we started with. OK. So that brings me on time to my conclusion. So hopefully I convinced you that rare earth atoms are great, and everyone should work on them. No, um, that rare earth atoms are great, except for all of their drawbacks. Um, and then in particular, the fact this flexibility of our host material is, is really one of our big benefits. Um, and thanks to the group and to the funding. Well, uh, I'll representatively clap here. Uh, thank you very much, Elizabeth, uh, for a very nice talk and a lot of great work. Um, and I would encourage everybody to yeah, enter your questions now if you have any last minute questions to ask. Um, yeah, I can kick it off with the atomic frequency combs. Um, 
I know some people use these shelving states to get much longer storage times. Do you have the opportunity to do that? Yeah. So, um, I mean, you could, the, the problem with doing that, you can get longer storage times, but it kills your bandwidth um, and it kills your optical depth. And so um, it's true. You can, you can, can do that. I, I'm, unless if we can make our stoichiometric materials work and we can resolve these different um, spin transitions, then the thing to do would be to make an optical, uh, an atomic frequency comb and then do the spin state storage in that system. And we could take it, get all of the, all of the optical depth and all of the, the storage time and at least the bandwidth we can get given the, the state splitting. Um, yeah. Great. And my other question here is you're thinking about all of these materials. Um, I guess, how do you, do you consider their photonic properties at the same time, like the ability to make waveguides and you know, how do you select for that? Right. So for our, 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 our grand material search, we are not currently um, worrying about that. We would really just like to make this, this, this low homogeneous broadening. Um, if we can make that work, then we can start to worry. But yeah, we're not really, sure. for that, we're not really investigating materials with particular mm -hmm. photonic properties um, at this point. Fair enough. Okay. Any other last minute questions? Give everybody a minute. All right. Well, thank you for a really wonderful start to our full semester of Vamos talks here. Um, and thank you everyone for attending. We actually had a fairly large participation <laughs> today uh, live, which is great to see. Um, we'll be continuing again in two weeks from today. Uh, Suzanne Yellen from Harvard University will give the next talk and um, we'll get her title and abstract out to you all on the email list very soon. So um, thanks again, Elizabeth. Thanks to all the panelists and all the attendees and uh, have a great week, everybody. Two weeks. <laughs> See you again in two weeks.